Hi, uh, I'm Preston Van Loon, co-founder of Prismatic Labs. We're a team of open source blockchain uh, developers with a special interest in bringing Ethereum to a truly global scale. So we've been working over the past year with uh, Ethereum researchers, other developers, to try to shape what Ethereum 2.0 is going to look like and to build uh, new clients. So we've been working with uh, nearly a dozen teams, uh, both independently and collaboratively, to try to redefine Ethereum. And this is, this is a massive uh, rewrite of the entire system. Um, our specific goal uh, is that we want to provide a production-ready client for, for participants in a new uh, ecosystem to be ready on day zero. Taking a look at the team, um, we started just over a year ago in January of 2018. We were looking at Ethereum and all of us were new to Ethereum. We hadn't contributed in any major way yet, but we wanted to be a part of it. We wanted to um, help solve this problem of scalability because it's, it, we were seeing, especially around this time at the end of 2017, that the, it just doesn't scale. Um, so we, we saw from the Ethereum researchers that they had what seemed to be a complete uh, specification for, for sharding. So we sa started asking the same question to each other. Why is nobody building this? It seems ready to build. Let's, let's do it. Like, I want to get involved. So we put a team together and just started building it. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <coughs> And throughout the last year, we've received a lot of community support. Um, we've got funding through the Ethereum Foundation, Ethereum uh, Community Fund, of course, Aragon Nest, and even the Vitalik YOLO Fund. So that's pretty great. <laughs> uh, and I'm happy to say that as of today, there was four full-time software engineers, a couple part-time people, and over 30 open source contributors on our GitHub project. So taking a look at uh, Ethereum 2.0 at a, at a super high level, it, it, it essentially consists of these three projects coming together to solve different problems uh, in Ethereum 1.0 today. So the first one being a proof of stake civil resistance mechanism. This is an alternative to proof of work. And the key benefits here are that there's a much lower barrier to entry uh, if you think about what, it what it's going to take you to I individually mine a single block on Ethereum, you're going to need a whole server farm or to be operating a server, um, a mining pool of some kind. And that's really expensive upfront cost. Additionally, the cost to operate the compute for, those, uh, for that hardware is, is also really expensive. Uh, additionally, the, the hardware that you purchased depreciates over time and certainly won't be worth as much when you're done grinding away with those CP, uh, GPUs. So with proof of stake, the alternative here is that you put forth some uh, reasonably uh, or significantly smaller amount of capital to hold you accountable for what you're doing. And then when you're producing blocks, it's, it's very little uh, resource intensive. So we get a much a huge energy savings uh, with proof of stake over proof of work. The next concept here uh, is sharding, which really follows closely behind the traditional database sharding, where if you have too much data to fit on one machine, you can partition it and distribute it over many machines. And the key benefit for Ethereum here is that we can now execute transactions um, concurrently. So if we had one shard today and we have 1,024 tomorrow, we can see that this is a, a, an immediate and incredible throughput increase in terms of the number of transactions we can do at a single time. The last project here is called eWASM. Uh, it's an Ethereum flavor of WebAssembly. And the intention here is to replace the Ethereum virtual machine with something that's a bit more performant and has a better standard. If you've ever read the WebAssembly spec, it's a truly amazing modern specification. The key benefit is that um, we'll see optimizations for uh, contract execution so that uh, all participants in the network, whether or not you're a validator, executor, or, or otherwise, you 
can save on CPU cycles for these new with this new virtual machine. Additionally, it should enable support for alternative uh, contract languages. So what we're working on is a client called Prism. This is a fully featured Ethereum 2.0 client. It's written in the Go programming language, and we leverage world-class tooling such as the Bazel build tool for incremental builds, uh, gRPC framework for inter-process communication. We use Bolt DB for our data, data layer storage, and we use libp2p by Protocol Labs for the peer-to-peer -peer communication layer. I want to highlight a few key features that make this, uh, that make the, our client stand out in terms of being a production ready client. So something that's really critical and important to users, uh, particularly validators, is liveliness. So with Prism, you're going to be able to deploy highly available configurations so that you're ensured that you're always online, especially when it's your turn to propose a block. From a DevOps perspective, you're going to want great visibility on how your node is operating. Here we'll be ex exporting production level metrics, request tracing, and much more. When we're building pr Prism, we do it very thoughtfully and very carefully, because we know that this code is going to last for a long time. With that, we enforce high code quality standards, such as enforcing great unit tests, um, reasonable amounts of code coverage, and excellent documentation. Lastly, we optimize for performance because if, it, if we can reduce the cost for validators, we can therefore increase their profit. So that's an important metric for us. If you'd like to learn more, check out our website, prismaticlabs.com or our GitHub. And if you have any questions, we have um, this foam microphone ball I can throw at people. Uh, if you'd like to meet with us afterwards, um, we're all wearing this Prismatic Lab shirt or you can reach us out on Twitter. Oh, okay, I don't know if I'm gonna throw it that far. Let's see, here we go. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so how do you talk in it? That was it, you had it? So should, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, so how, do, how your roadmap looks like? What's your like view of the future? Yeah, so we, we're following closely along with the general Ethereum 2.0 roadmap. So the first phase is called phase zero, which is pretty much constructing just this, um, the backbone of the entire system called the beacon chain. And then following that, there are two more phases, phase one and two. Um, I encourage you to look more into it. I d don't have time to go entirely in detail. But our immediate roadmap is what we're hoping to do is r release some uh, test network in the next coming months where we can see Prism clients interacting with each other and sort of see the, de the de deposit flow and validator initiation. Yep. I can throw it back, okay. Oh. Uh, counts, got it. Another question? Yep. <laughs> Have you been able to salvage much from Geth? Uh, no, so that's a great question because we, like, we really value that project, it's an amazing project, and we want it to be like, exactly compatible with them. So we started the client off as a fork and just sort of like adding on the Ethereum 2.0 pieces. But as we went along, we found that uh, this is different and that is different and actually everything is completely different. So the only thing that we're using from Go Ethereum is the, the nice like, contract binding they have so we can call into the um, Ethereum 1 chain contracts. So. Unfortunately, can't reuse most of their code. That's too bad. I think we have time for one more question, if anybody's brave enough. Another one over here? Okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. Not so good this time. Hey, um, do you do a lot testing with some tools um, already? Yes, this is a great question. We do some benchmarks on our, on, our, on our unit tests, but in terms of testing of the entire system, that is on our roadmap. There's a team called White Block that's uh, really great at doing that kind of stuff. So we'll be partnering closely with them to sort of see what does the load testing the entire network look like. All right, thank you, everybody. So, hi. 
My name is uh, Matthew Cormier. I'm the project lead at Espresso. And today I'm going to show you what we've been working on for the last couple of months. So we've been mainly working on two different projects. The data store, which is a storage library with built-in per permission management, and the drive app, uh, which is uh, an Aragon app that basically provides a Dropbox-like user experience. So let's start with the data store. Um, when we started working with the Aragon stack, uh, we noticed that there was a lot of great tools. You know, there's a, a really nice set of UI components that makes it really easy to build uh, great user interfaces. Uh, there's also a great set of, uh, of smart contracts. Uh, I can't understate how helpful it is to have built-in upgradability in our apps. Um, but we, rea we realized that there was one thing missing. Well, at least one thing. Uh, there was no standard way to store file, to store content. Uh, you know, there are all these different storage services available, like uh, IPFS, Swarm, Filecoin. But, but you still have to build another layer on top of them to manage permissions, like which user has access to which files. So we decided to tackle this problem with the data store which consists of mainly uh, two parts, a JavaScript library as the main developer uh, tool, and an Aragon smart contract to store sensitive information, like, um, like permissions and, uh, and file ownership. But what does the data store provide exactly? Four things. Uh, it's built from the ground up to, uh, to work with Aragon apps. It uses the Aragon kernel, so it's upgradable. And it also uses the ACL, so it's really easy to integrate into any Aragon apps. Um, it's storage agnostic. So we already support uh, IPFS and Swarm, and we'll be able to support uh, pretty much any storage services in the future, like Filecoin, for example. Um, of course, uh, it handles all the permission logic. Uh, who can create a file? Who can modify its content? Who can rename it? Who can grant access to another people for this file? And uh, in a future version, we'll also have built-in uh, encryption support. Uh, but what does it look like on the code level? Uh, this is a normal... Uh, Aragon uh, smart contracts, and uh, if you want to add the data store, you simply inherit the, the data store smart contract and set up the settings uh, according to, uh, to what your app requires. Um, but why inheritance? Um, we initially wanted to, uh, to create the data store uh, smart contract instance outside the, the app and simply pass it through the initialization function but it was not possible, uh, it, it's not possible right now. Uh, Aragon doesn't support currently uh, external, in, it, external intents, which is basically a way for the front end to communicate with uh, external smart contracts. But uh, as soon as uh, Aragon uh, supports those external intents, you'll be able to, uh, to use the data store by composition instead of inheritance. And that's pretty much all you have to do uh, on the smart contract level. On the front end, these are a couple of examples of how to use the library. So you initialize it uh, with the uh, Aragon app object uh, to, uh, to manage the communication with the smart contract. Uh, if you want to upload a file, you call the add file function with the file name as the, uh, as the first parameter and the file content as an array buffer. And if you want, for example, to grant access to a specific person for a file, you call the set write permission with the file ID as the first permission, as the first argument, and the, uh, the, the entity address as the second one. We have a couple more examples on, uh, on our GitHub uh, repo. I'll just go back for a second. Uh, so you can go have a, a look at it if you want, and we are always available by email if you got uh, any questions about uh, the data store. And now I want to show you a small demo of the, the Drive app itself. So this is basically the, 
the main interface where you have all the all your files for your uh, for your DAO. If you want to add a new file or add a new folder, you just click this button. So uh, we'll add a test folder. We also get labels. So if you want to uh, to sort your files. Uh, with uh, more than folders, you can pretty much create any number of labels that you want. So I'll just uh, assign a new label to this specific file. And then when the, la and then when the label is created, you, s you can click on it and see all the files that are labeled as important, for example. Um, we also got groups, so if you got the multiple person who shares pretty much uh, the same files or the same permissions, you can create groups. And of course, we got permissions. So I got this user right here who doesn't have any permission at all. So if I want to give him access to the following file, I simply uh, copy his, uh, his wallet address. And then from my main account, I add his address to the permission list. And then he should have, uh, and then you see the, the permission added in the permission list. And then after a refresh, you should see that uh, the, the person has permission. Uh, what's a permission? You can rename the file, you can change file content, and uh, there's pretty much uh, there's, uh, more things to, you can do uh, with it. Uh, so This also works with folders. So if, for example, if you want to grant permission to multiple files at the same time, you can simply, uh, simply grant the permission on the folder itself, and the user will have permission on all the, on the files uh, contained in the, in the folder. So that's uh, pretty much it for the presentation. Uh, do you guys uh, have uh, any questions? Uh, where? Oh, OK, here. I didn't plan to have a question and uh, answer, but this was too cool to, <laughs> to, to not throw. Hey, uh, so is all this stored on chain? Yeah, this is, uh, well, well, no, the, the, the files itself are not stored on chains. You choose, you actually choose uh, which storage provider that you would like. So right now uh, it uses IPFS. You can use Swarm, but uh, right now it's in beta. And we are working to, uh, to bring Filecoin to, and pretty much any storage provider. We just, uh, we simply have to add it. So am I keeping a reference to, to that file on-chain? Yeah, on chain? yeah. Okay. It, only, it, it only keeps the reference and, of course, the permissions, so, it's, uh, so, so it can be safe. Thanks. Yeah. Is it over? Yeah. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, I'm Mike Calvinis. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of Level K. Um, uh, Level K is uh, an application development company focused on Ethereum. Uh, we've been working a lot on various uh, governance, decentralized governance uh, implementations. I'm going to talk about Futarchy today. We've also done some work with token curated registry. Uh, and we also do uh, security auditing for smart contracts. Uh, so here's part of the Level K team. These are the folks who contributed to the Aragon Futarchy app. John Kelleher, myself, Mike Calvinis, Chris Winfrey, Emily Williams, and Eric Hunter. Uh, I'm going to go through and kind of explain, like, uh, at a high level, what Futarchy is. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our application uh, that we built on Aragon and show some, some screenshots. So simplest way I can describe Futarchy is we're using markets to make decisions. Uh, in the context of our application, we are using uh, Gnosis prediction markets uh, to make decisions. Uh, so 
With futarchy, like you, uh, the decision could be phrased as a, as a question. So the question here is, uh, should we do this smart contract upgrade to 2.0? So we can phrase the market itself as a question, which is, what will a token price be in 30 days if smart contract upgrade to 2.0 is executed? Um, so if we break this down, we have like three kind of main points with Futarchy. You've got uh, a metric, so token price in this case, and that's what we're, we're trying to maximize for uh, the token price. Uh, a time frame, so that's the time frame in which uh, the market will, will resolve. So we're trying to pre basically predict or have the uh, permissionless, use, uh, permissionless uh, system where anyone can come in and predict, make their prediction on what they think the token price will be in 30 days. Uh, if the smart contract upgrade is executed. So what we do for Futarchy, and this is kind of a simplification of, you can have many different models of Futarchy, but in, in this kind of simplified example, we have two markets that we set up uh, to make a binary decision, whether or not to execute this upgrade. Um, so one market asks, what will the token price be in 30 days if the upgrade is executed? Second market asks, what will the token price be in 30 days if the upgrade is not executed? Uh, then you have open trading on these markets, and you take the, the average price. In, in our case, we're taking average price, but you can, you can use other, other metrics, other ways of, of calculating this. But take the average price for 15 days on that market. So full market is 30 days. We take the average price for the first 15 days and look at the prediction for each one. And whichever one is higher, that's the decision that actually gets executed. So what's really interesting about this is this, it's not, it seems a little bit like voting, but it's actually fundamentally different from voting. Uh, if you're participating in these markets, you can, you'll, you'll probably have the best chance of making a profit if you're completely unbiased about the decision itself. You don't have to be trying to influence it, yes or no. Uh, you're going you're gonna to profit the most if you're accurately able to predict the future price based on the decision. So that's really important to know. So in this case, uh, the market was predicting that the price would go up higher if the upgrade gets executed. So that decision wins. V2 upgrade actually gets executed. Uh, so why would we use Futarchy? Uh, it's a system of permissionless government governance, so decentralized. Uh, it's focused on metrics and, and really maximizing value of metrics. So in most of the examples that we're looking at, we're using token price. You could also use uh, other metrics uh, that you want to maximize. You can really set it up any way that you want. Uh, and it's, it's fun to participate on Futarchy markets and potentially profitable. Uh, people love trading and speculating and betting. Uh, this kind of harnesses that, the demand for that, and uh, adds value, like for uh, a DAO, for example, to actually make good decisions. Uh, so what are some downsides of Futarchy? Uh, potentially susceptible to market manipulation. You have um, you know, potential for sort of a 51% attack if someone it manages to buy up a large portion of the network. Uh, potentially bad for like low impact decisions. Uh, and we don't know like at which point this breaks down. If you have like thousands and thousands of Futarchy decisions, they might not, each individual one might have a low impact on that metric. So it might not work well, but because we haven't really implemented any of these yet, we don't actually know. Um, and then you have a potential problem of like self-referential markets where uh, people trading on the markets would, might tend to follow the, the trend of the market rather than like the, uh, what, what they actually think the future price would be. Uh, so, all right, I'll get into the app now. So we, built, we spent the past couple months working on a, a Futarchy app with uh, Aragon stack for the UI and like the higher level DAO contracts. And we used Gnosis uh, prediction markets to actually like facilitate trading on, on uh, the Futarchy markets. A couple goals we had when working on this project. 
Uh, we wanted to create like a pretty general app that any DAO could use. Uh, and we wanted to make it, most importantly, really simple for users to interact with, because Futarchy is kind of a complex, like intimidating concept. And we, we really worked hard to like design an application that made it less intimidating and a little more user friendly. So I'm going to show a couple screenshots from uh, our designs. Um, we have a sort of market status at a, at a glance. So for any given decision in the application, you can see uh, kind of which, which side is winning out and what that, that average price metric is. Like what's, what's the market predicting if yes? What's the market predicting if no? Um, so we have like a panel of these for, for uh, you, whatever uh, the, your DAO that you set up. And you can kind of see each one at a glance. You can also go in and, and make your prediction. So if you want to participate in this, then you make a prediction. Uh, and what we're, what we're really asking is for you to make a prediction whether you think uh, for like the, if the decision is executed. If yes, do you think the, uh, the price is going to be higher than the market's predicting or lower? So we make it really easy for users to basically make a, a binary choice here. Uh, and then, of course, as you interact with these things, you're going to want to know how well you're performing. Like, am I, am I gaining? Am I losing? So we uh, put a lot of thought into like a performance metric dashboard to kind of like gamify this thing. Um, and this one happens to be losing, but hopefully if you participate, then yours will be green. Uh, if you, uh, you want to contribute or see the app, build it yourself, like implement it in your DAO, you can access it here. It's open source, level K dev slash Futarchy app. And that's it. I uh, hope you guys have some questions because I really want to throw this thing. Yeah. Any questions on Futarchy or the app? All right. Oh, oh, okay, that was pretty good. All right, so <laughs> um, in your example, you use the price of a token in the future. Mm -hmm. Is there any other kind of metrics you can use the Futurarchy for that you will support? Yeah, I think you could, you could use any metric you want. So we're actually, that, that's the, for the resolution of the Oracle that we're using. And our app isn't opinionated about which Oracle you use. So you could literally use any metric you want as long as it's like verifiable through a smart contract transaction. Right, so, but this is like an implementation in Aragon. So like you would have a default Oracle? Um, we, we're not sure yet actually. Yeah, we, we, we could have a default Oracle, but you can also like use your own Oracle. And it might be like different flavors of this app. Maybe it ends up being different, different apps with different Oracles, but yeah. Oh, any other questions? Oh, okay. I'll do one more. I think it's kind of hard to throw. All right. <laughs> Did I break it? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they told me to throw it. So uh, <laughs> we all know that uh, people are risk averse. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a talking holder who would like to vote, this is a zero sum game. Yes. But still, there are, like, well, there are manipulators. And. Uh, from my perspective, uh, it's worth not participating in Futarchy at all, not to lose your tokens. Mm. So uh, maybe by minting some new tokens, uh, so that that would be not zero-sum game, we could uh, like let make people vote more. So how do you uh, see the problem? Yeah, that's that's possible. I think there's still, even though you might not want to participate, I think some people would want to take the risk and participate, but I think that's a potential problem for sure. And I think there's only one way to find out. It's deploy a few of these and see what yeah. kind of levels of participation you get and then and, analyze uh, that. When will we be able to test that? Um, hopefully, hopefully soon. I think we're going to have this out on testnet like within probably the next few weeks. And then at some point, we will de be deploying mainnet DAOs with this application. So. 
follow us on Twitter and you'll find out about it. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. Oh, yeah. I'll... Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Ashley.